prokaryotes? Yes, ribosomes are found in prokaryotes. Good. Okay, so fungus is my first one. Most of them are going to be multicellular, like most eukaryotic organisms are multicellular. One exception is yeast. Okay, that is the only one that is unique. Got the exception down? Random factoid you have to know. So exception is yeast, that is the unicellular one. The yeast just look like a little blob. That's what it looks like. They're just a ball. But they're eukaryotic. Uh, plants are made of, have a, do have a cell wall there. It's made of chitin. Like kite, like a flying kite. Not chitin. Okay, it's chitin. Most people love to say the other version. Okay, they are uh, heterotrophic, heterotrophic because they do, not cons uh, they do not make their food. They have to consume it. They usually have a special way of consuming their food, though. How? Anybody? Fungus gets on your fungal spores, float around your house, they get on your bread. What happens? Mold. Okay, mold grows. Why are they on your bread? Are they eating the bread? Yeast. Mm, no, yeast is that's, that's, that's living. That's actually already killed in the bread. It's no longer there. They just help make the bread rise. Why are they on your bread? They taste good. How do they eat the bread? They decay it by decomposition. Now, when they decompose it, they're not consuming it. They absorb the nutrients into their bodies. They do not eat it. They don't have a mouth to go nom nom nom. Okay? They absorb it into their bodies. So you need to write someplace under motor nutrition heterotrophic, uh, and then they're decomposers usually, and they absorb the nutrients. They, they absorb nutrients because that's very special because plants and animals don't absorb nutrients. They either make nutrients or they consume it. That's why fungi are very different. And then their ways of reproduction, they also have two methods. They can do sexual or asexual. Sexual, just like we talked about spores forming, spore from the left half of the kitchen is floating around, spore from the right half of the kitchen is floating around. They both meet on the bread, they mingle, and that's the, that's the two spores coming together, which are two gametes. That's sexual reproduction for fungi. So you guys are eating that baby fungus and eat that mold. But who eats mold? So hopefully nobody. It's really not that bad for you. It builds up that immune system. Okay, um, so spores and then, uh, oh, budding. So asexual reproduction that yeast can do. Here's a yeast. Here's, get ready for it, asexual reproduction. It makes this like a little mini knee. It's like a little tumor. And then it gets a little bit bigger. And then it gets a little bit bigger. And then it just splits. So it kind of buds off, and that's what budding is for an example of asexual. And they should be identical. Yeast are really the only fungi that do it. Um, but you guys remember the eight, the uh, sexual way that I talked about yeast reproducing? Spores. That spores is just generally all fungi can do spores. Yeast have a very special way that they can sexually re reproduce. It starts with shmoo, ends with ing. Shmooing, you remember that? Okay, so shmooing, that's a new phenomenon that they've discovered in the past five years. Textbook books don't include it because they're old. Um, Plants, they are eukaryotic, multicellular, mainly all, all of them are. Uh, cellulose is their cell wall, not chitin, very different. And we know they're autotrophs. There's not a whole lot that's special here. Oh, one thing I didn't note here on the reproduction side. How do plants reproduce? I know sexually, but how? Pollination. pollination, thank you. So they have pollination. So sperm, I mean, uh, the pollen is plant sperm. The flower is the plant ovary. Pollen gets into into the plant flower, makes an ovary, which is a ripened fruit, and you eat the ovary. Or a bear eats the ovary. Well, it's probably in that fruit. That's going to be like serving as an embryo. See, bear eats the eats the ovary, which is like an apple, for, for example. Bear poops out the seeds. Seeds are translocated to another area. Boom, baby plant. That is that is why uh, plants have fruit. It's not for you or or anything else. It's to attract other animals so that they will consume it, so that they will spread their seeds. That's all. Plants are pretty smart. Okay, um, last category, animals. No, of course they don't have a cell wall. We know we're not stiff as a board, okay, we're not sticking around like this. We know that we are heterotrophic by ingestion. We consume, we do not decompose and, and absorb. And then you know that we have gametes, sexual reproduction. Gametes in this case are sperm and egg as well. Whew. So you guys can make sure your bottom two uh, rows are filled out. The interesting are the unique facts and 
what was, what was the last time you were in Campbell? In Campbell. So we can cover those later. But I just want to make sure. Did most of, most of this was reviewed, right? So the new stuff was kind of like chitin, cellulose, the RK bacteria category, probably in the produce category. A lot of it, though, should be reviewed. And we're going to really kind of delve into the big details in our next unit. Okay? Uh, let's do. I'm going to have you guys work on this first. In front of you, you have a biological classification introductory activity. You can work with the person next to you. I don't care where you write this, if you're writing your notes, um, just not on this paper, please. The, the very first example kind of illustrates a real life example of classification and how you have broad categories and specific categories. It's an envelope example. Those, these can be really short and quick answers. I'm going to say 15 minutes, and we should be done with the first page. 20 minutes. Okay. You can talk to the person next to you if you want. So this will serve as a good introduction to classification. This is the first part. I want you to go first. This is the first part. All right, so number seven, use linearian taxonomic grouping. Okay, we can play that. Which of the two, which two of the three cats in model two are closely related? What did you guys say? Lion, tiger. Lion, tiger, because they have the same everything in, until species. species, right? They are help. They have everything same down even to the genus. Their species just makes them different. Would the lion and tiger be able to successfully interbreed? No. Why no? Right, they're not the same species. They can interbreed. They can make a liger. It can happen but it's not gonna be able to reproduce, okay? Itself, it will be sterile. Um, okay, at which taxonomic level do the two cats separate? Species level, thank you. What is the most specific taxonomic grouping that all three, three cats have the same? Family. Family, because they all have the Felidae, the same, because that's the family category. Uh, what's different about the way this genus and species names are written compared to everything else? Italicized? Species is lowercase and? Genus is uppercase. Those are the three things that you need to know. Okay, if you didn't write that down, write that down now. Italicized, because that allows you to recognize it as a scientific name. Common name for a lion is a lion. Notice lion is not uh, italicized. The species, I mean, the uh, scientific name is Panthera leo. So that means that that is now a, called a scientific name. It's italicized, and we recognize the first name to be a capital letter and the second name to be a lowercase letter. Okay, so just like Homo sapiens, capital H, lowercase s. All right, number 12. The genus and species are collectively referred to as the scientific name. Okay, so we've just identified scientific names. Um, the naming system is called binomial nomenclature. Binomial, what does that word mean to you? Nomial. Nomial actually refers to number. It's, it's, it's two in number. It's got a two number naming system. Uh, but the name, the name part though is a different part. So nomenclature, that word means to name. In chemistry, when you get to nomenclature, it's a huge ordeal because you're learning a new language like sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, dinitrogen tetroxide, copper two sulfate pentahydrate. It's very, oh. yeah, it's very uh, specific in the way you name things. So there's a, na a naming system for a lot of different sciences. In, sci in biology, we use a biological naming system, binomial nomenclature. In chemistry, you use IUPAC, which is International Union of Something Something Chemist. Pure and applied science, or chemist, yeah. So yeah, I was like, what does the IUPAC mean? So that's why we just have to know the different naming systems. But this one includes the Linnaeus system. Okay, so it's always written in two parts. The genus name is written first, and the species name is written second. Good so far? Should somebody else shake their head? I've got three people shaking yes. their head. Okay. Um, scientific name is always written in italicized. italicized. If it is handwritten, it is underlined cursive. I'm sorry, it is written in cursive or underlined. The first letter of the genus name is a capital letter. Thank you. The system is used all over the uh, all over the world. Why do you think Latin is used instead of a more modern language? Anybody? It does stand out. That's true. That's not the exact reason. It's a static language. It is static. What do you mean by that? No one really says it anymore, so you can't really change the meaning of the words. It's just written. Right. Like, whoever came up with the word swag. Swag. Okay. Did you? Yeah, I think that's kind of awesome. Did not know that one from the Shakespeare. 
But now we've changed the we change the meaning since then. Okay, cool. So for modern language, I'll wait on you guys. For modern language, we change the meaning and we use terms in different ways all the time. All the time. So in Latin language, that nobody speaks Latin. Latin is kind of embedded in some of our language as is, but we use it to portray a certain meaning, like uh, prefixes and stuff. So Latin is a static language. No one's going to use it and say, oh, yeah, I'm going I'm to make up this new cool word with Latin, and it's going to mean something else when I say it. Yeah. So no one changes the way it, what it means, and so it is universal. Everybody uses the same dead language because we don't use it for real anymore, like speaking. So it's a dead language that we use that can uh, withstand humanity's uh, ability to change language. Okay, um, where are we at? 14? Yeah. Using the system, would it be possible for two different species to have the same name? Waiting? No. no, thank you. In Linnaeus's time, time, classification was based on appearance of organisms. Think about appearances of tadpoles, frogs, sharks, and dolphins, and penguins, blah, blah. What are the limitations of classifying organisms only on their appearance? What would you guys say? Like the um, homologous tree. Right, they can have homologous structures and analogous structures, and that might fool you as to say, you know, Homologous, yeah, they're somewhat related. They're, they've inherited that structure from an ancestor. But analogous, I mean, they might look really similar, but they are not evolutionary that closely related. So it can be misleading to have a similar characteristic, however, not be evolutionary closely related. You guys good so far? Thank you. All right, um, list three additional ways besides appearance that could be used to help classify animals or, or organisms. Gia, tell me one. Uh, DNA. DNA. Uh, Sean, tell me another. Jackson's your buddy. You know, you guys were talking earlier, so I'm sure you're talking about this problem, right? Pedigree. Oh, okay. So pedigree is based on genetics, though. So. I'll say RNA. We'll go RNA, DNA. That's somewhat related. Thank you. One more. What about like behavior? Uh, adaptations, like behavioral adaptations, possibly. Anything else? No. Yeah. Uh, skeletal, skeletal structure is still a structure, but it's internal, so you could you could say that's based on in-depth appearance. Anything else? Maybe like uh, processes, ph physiological uh, adaptations, yeah? Chromosome number? Chromosome number, that'd be great. Maybe, <laughs> maybe like the ability to digest certain things based on your enzymatic structure and DNA. That's all based off DNA. I was gonna say proteins too, so that's cool. Okay, and let's do our last four here. So we have this huge organizational chart. We have the energy source. Notice that there is some, another further broader uh, category tax that's called a domain. Okay, so of all of our six kingdoms, know that animalia, plants, uh, fungus, and protista, they're all eukaryotes, right? So they fall in the eukarya domain. That's just like a broader uh, uh, category. Archaea bacteria are in the archaea domain and bacteria, are you bacteria in the bacteria uh, domain? Those are pretty like, duh, we got this. Um, 17, how many domains are shown? Three. Three. We just did that, we just did that. How many kingdoms are shown? Six. I think you guys can do this. I'm done. Okay, let's hit the last part of our notes and then we'll practice with a uh, dichotomy. That's kind of fun. So you can take this on the same piece of paper that you guys were previously writing on, on your worksheet, wherever. If you need a stand up, get a stand up. One minute stretch break. One minute stretch break. Some water. Mm -hmm. Are we? Oh, look, we got push-ups in the back. We do push-ups. Can you do toe touches? Turkeys.
Warrior? I know where you stand on one foot. Like this or this? No. <laughs> okay. Back to your seats. Let's do this, people. You have 10 seconds to go back to your seats, and we're going to start this together. I'll find one. Okay, I'm ready. You guys ready? Guys and girls. Okay. Thank you for being quiet. All right, I'm going to hit the highlights here. Write down what you need to. There's not a whole lot to write there. Basically, we've already done, we've already discussed modern classification systems. There was one guy before the current guy. Who was the current guy we just talked about in the, in the worksheet? Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus, okay? He is the kind of the person who helped establish our more modern system of classification. The very, very, very first person to establish some sort of, I think there's different uh, categories of animals or, or organisms. His name is Aristotle, you know him, okay? So, so Aristotle was the very first guy. So you need to know that he's, you need to know that he started the ability or the thought that we need to classify organisms into multiple categories. But he was very simplistic with it. He was like, I see plants and I see animals. Therefore, we have plants and animals as two categories. That's it. So he was obviously wrong. What was he missing? Everything else. Everything else. Uh, bacteria, fungi, protists, archaea bacteria. So those are things that they didn't have the technology to see. We currently have lots and lots of technology that helps us see these things. Um, so he kind of established the uh, study of taxonomy. Taxonomy studies taxa. What were taxa again? Right. So they study taxa, which are the different groups of classification or categorization. Now, I'm not saying different groups like animals, plants, fungi, blah, blah, blah. Those are kingdom. He studied, okay, there's a big, broad category, and there's a little bit of a less broad, and then less broad, less broad, less broad. So he, when I say tax, I mean kingdom, phyla, class, order, family, genus, species. All right, so he was obviously wrong. Carl Linnaeus picked up on that, changed the way things were done. He, was, he decided on binomial nomenclature. This is everything you know. You know this stuff. We just went over this stuff. I'm not going to spend forever on this. You already know Carl Linnaeus was, was the one who picked up uh, after Aristotle. We also know the scientific names have these characteristics. They're Latin, italicized. We use Latin because it's universal. We can't confuse it with anything else without changing the language. It's very, uh, it's very scientific. Okay, so scientific name. We use the scientific names because common names are misleading. What do you guys call that organism right there? A seahorse. That baby is not a horse. Okay, I don't know who named it a horse, but I don't know what they were thinking. That is not a horse. So it's very misleading to, to call something one thing when it doesn't even resemble what your more common name would be. I don't know the scientific name for a seahorse right now, but I'll look it up for you. Okay, so we use scientific names versus common names, but common names are what everybody usually refers to or uses to. So I don't know. Like, you call the butterfly a butterfly. I don't know. All right, this is the part we've not gotten to yet. <coughs> Phylogenetics is what we've not talked about. Phylo is referring to the, the term phylo refers to the word tribe, and it just means group. So uh, taxonomy, classification, and phylogenetics, they all go together. And so Modern, you know, modern theory, we know a lot more about genes and, and the, the evolutionary relationship and things like phylogenetics uses a more modern method of classifying and grouping things together. It uses evolutionary relationships. So you need to revert, refer or refer to the word phylogeny when you're or phylogenetics when you're referring to evolutionary genetic relationships. It's kind of like our modern way of saying classification. 
And there's a couple more terms that um, they're so exciting. And I guess repeat your pants, you're so excited. But this is a lot of uh, usage of vocabulary in an appropriate way. Phylogenetics refers to the study of spe uh, classification based on evolutionary relationship. And then the actual process that uh, of using that method is called cladistics. Okay, so the process of actually doing it means that you're doing cladistics. So when you are grouping organisms based on evolutionary history, you are doing, you are a cladistician. Cladistician. You're scientists at cladistics. Um, so modern is going to be using evolutionary relationships. What do you think they look at? inside of an organism to help establish who's really closely related who's not. We were saying some of them earlier. DNA. So those are the biochemical evidences, evidences of, 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 you know, helping with establish what species are closely related, like DNA, RNA, amino acids. That's about it, though. That's usually what we use. So back in the day, though, you only used looks and looks and characteristics, and not DNA. Good here. Okay, cool. All right. So here's an example of old versus new taxonomy. Notice in the old way of, of uh, this is like a this is a family tree or an evolutionary tree called a family tree. It's also called something called a cladogram. Why do you think it's called a cladogram? Because cladistics people who study cladistics make these graphs. Okay. So look at and what do they show here? is closely related. What organisms? Uh, all right, so turtles, lizards, snakes, and crocodiles. They're showing that all those are closely related because they're grouping them as a class reptilia. But they did not have the data to support that. So currently, this is traditional uh, taxonomy. They're a little harder to read with these branchings uh, that are occurring. But you can see on this graph, on this branch over here, that aves, which is just another name for birds, they formed right after the crocodiles kind of branched off that current kind of pathway, right? So to me, I'm seeing that birds and crocodiles are really closely related because they just branched at that very last minute there. So they're up, this is kind of like a string of DNA. And as you branch off, your DNA changes just a little bit. So to me, crocodiles and birds are very similar because I know the modern taxonomy way of drawing these uh, cladograms. So here is another example. And you can see that the this is the earliest of all the reptiles. And as you go up the line, you're showing more recent times. So the very first organisms to branch off of reptiles was that dog there. Okay, and then we have a turtle, lizard, snake, crocodile, and then birds are the last ones to speciate or to evolve. Okay, so to me, which ones are going to be, or to you now, which ones are going to be most closely related? Right, because they have this common ancestor here, and they've just recently branched apart, meaning their DNA has not been changing that much since then. Who's the least related? Dogs and birds. Dogs and birds, right, because they're farthest apart, meaning that there's been changes in DNA this whole time as it's been slowly evolving, and new species are branching, branching off because of their uh, inability to uh, coexist or reproduce. All right, so let's answer these couple questions. Some of these are kind of small, so I'm going to read this out loud. How does cladistic taxonomy, which is modern, differ from traditional taxonomy, which is old? So cladistics emphasizes evolutionary relationships while traditional taxonomy puts more emphasis on appearance. True or false? True. Okay, I'm not reading the rest of them. The first one is right. Good job, guys. Okay, uh, so we basically are looking at evolutionary DNA versus looks. Number two, why does cladistic the cladistic view group birds with crocodiles. They are clustered alphabetically. There's a close evolutionary relationship between the two groups. Crocodiles diverge later than birds. Birds are substantially different than mammals and were placed at the opposite end of the scheme. B. Right, B, because you're talking about evolutionary relationship. So pretty much if you see evolutionary relationship, almost guarantee that's the answer. Okay, good test taking tip there. All right, so I just showed you another example. Another example, this baby is called a cladogram. Okay, so cladistics, phylogeny, cladograms, they all kind of relate to evolutionary history. You don't really have to write down anything, unless you want to. Um, where else have you heard the suffix gram? Not gram crackers, that's a prefix. Culture gram, histogram. Hmm? Oh, no, not, not any histograms. So, histogram, what's a histogram look like? Right, it's like a graph. 
gram means graph. That's supposed to look like a graph for a science. <laughs> Okay, so you can see cladograms have things called clades. Lots of words today, I'm so sorry, but that is a clade because these, this clade is evolutionary related. That is a clade, that little branch, single branch, because they're all on that branch that are evolutionary related. Why is this not a clade? Okay, so they don't have a common recent branching, which would be a common, they don't have a recent common um, ancestor. Why is that not a clade? They're not as closely related. Right. This one over here is not as closely related to that one because they need to have a recent common ancestor, meaning that they would need to have something like here or here branching, not way down here, because that's too far back to consider them a group. A clade is like a group of similar organisms. There, that's not nearly similar enough. These up here, a little bit more similar because they branched just very recently. So three words, four words that we've now we now know. How do you use? Clade, cladogram, cladistics, and phylogeny or phylogenetics. Okay, good. So here's one more example, and you might be seeing a picture like this on your test where you have to give a little bit more of analysis of what's similar and what's not. Can you guys see all these words? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to show you the down down here first. As you go up this evolutionary tree, you'll see that characteristics are derived. Characteristics are just adaptations that we see uh, over time. So the very first adaptation or, or uh, characteristic that appeared was hair. Then the next one was uh, having big teeth, medium teeth, then retractable uh, claws, and the ability to purr. Okay, so these kind of slowly build up to isolate single species out. Yeah. So the second cat said the top later, is the most evolved? Not as the most evolved. It's it's very, very specific to these characteristics. The one at the very top has all of these characteristics. Whereas the turtle it doesn't, have it doesn't have any of those characteristics. And so it's a very it's a characteristic based tree, not necessarily most evolved. So that's different from the uh, the, the cladogram? It's it's different than the cladogram, but it has some um, support from the evolutionary standpoint. But if it's got the labels then yeah. you'll see if they have the labels of the characteristics that we're assuming they have some evolution relationship because that's I mean, you don't hear it something unless it's been genetically uh, coded for. Yeah. So it's saying that the, the cat evolved like after all of this? <coughs> that is true, yes. The domestic cat did. Okay, because that we have we have artificially selected for certain characteristics of that domestic cat. Alright, so basically you can see that uh, with the characteristics you can also group them in their taxa. Everything is in class mammalia except for the turtle, poor turtle. And then everything is a carnivore except for the horse, okay? But the horse has hair, and everything past it has hair. Turtle does not have hair. That would be awesome. Like a little mohawk. Okay. Um, everything is in family Philidae except for the wolf, right? The wolf does have the characteristics of the two here, the hair and the, car uh, the carnivor carnivorous teeth. And then we have the leopard and the domestic cat that are the last ones. They're in family Felidae. But you could further uh, narrow down the groups by adding what around the cat? Genus. All right, a genus. So the genus would isolate the cat from the, from the leopard if you had to do that. But this is called a phylogenetic tree. You can do it with characteristics, or you can just look at them and say who's similar and who's not. OK. I think that's all we did. That. Oh, this is just a fun fact. Fun fact. Bobcats, who's ever seen the Bobcats game? Okay, Bobcats game, the hornets are going way better, hopefully. Um, but they were being really sneaky and were big nerds, and they named him after his scientific name. The Bobcat's scientific name is Lynx Rufus, but they named him Rufus Lynxus because it, so it didn't seem like huge nerds. How cool is that, right? Because it's, you know, carn it's Mammalia, Carnova, uh, Felidae, and then genus is Lynx, and then species are are going to be Lynx Rufus or Lynx Canadius, but that one probably was like awful to name as a mascot name, so they chose Rufus. Rufus is cool. Yeah, so that was just fun fact. Wait, so Rufus isn't a part of a scientific name. Just no, Rufus is the scientific, is a part of one of the bobcats. What's There's the other part? The, the Lynx is the genus name and Rufus is the species name, that last part, but they switched it so they didn't seem like huge uh, nerds. Oh, this is another, so there's two different species that fall into the, the genus Lynx. 
So there's the Lynxus rufus and there's the Lynxus canadinius. So that's an actual lynx. The bobcat is the actual common name of lynx rufus. So they named the bobcat team rufus lynx. Okay, this is the part you've not written down yet. Write that down. Dichotomous key and then we practice. <coughs> so a dichotomous key is like a, it's just a tool used by scientists to identify something out in the wild. Dichotomous key is di means two. The key is referring to the fact that you can answer a question in two ways and slowly start to identify species. So if I went out in the wild and I'm looking around and I see some fluffy organism and they have feathers, my options are to either say feathers yes or feathers no. Well, I said they're fluffy, so they probably have feathers, right? All right, so on the feathers answer, I'm going to go yes. And if I further observe this weird organism, I see that it swims. I look at the answer yes it does swim and now i have identified it as a duck okay so this is a common example you, you can do this without the key but when you're looking at things you've never seen before you can start to classify them based on their characteristics because that's usually what we can observe so if i was out in the wild and i said no i see an organism with no feathers and it has legs what would you say lizard. lizard and then if i said it had feathers but no it can't swim a head okay so this is really easy Let's do one example from your, um, I just passed out a worksheet. Salamanders, I'm going to finish passing those out. Let's do one example together and then you guys can do this. Salamanders? Yes. Um, I have some, let me see how many I have to share. Um, you guys might have to share, but let me see how many I have here. All right, I have one more. Pass out that way. One more. All right, you see the salamander. I don't have any more. I'm using this one. You guys can share. You have two, you're two feet between you. All right, now this is a this key is a little hard to read, but pretty much what you have to do, and, and please listen to this instruction because I don't want you to mess up when you do this on your own. You have to start at the top of the key. Now this key is not a branching pattern like that first one was. It's a table. It says figure 3.3 classifications key to certain salamanders. Looking at salamander one, you can see he's black. He's got white spots, forearms. Yeah, no, no external gills. The one that has external gills, can you identify that salamander? Which one? Number six and ten. ten. Okay, that's what external gills looks like. It's got a kind of a frilly, feathery looking gill. So when you look at the top of the key, you see number one, A and B. Hind limbs, absent hind limbs present. So number one, does he have hind limbs? Yes. What does it what do the instructions say? Go to two. Okay, is everybody following me so far? About how it works. So then you point to two. You see two A and two B. External gills present, external gills absent. <laughs> Absent, so go to three. Okay, larger size over seven or smaller size under seven? Um, somebody has a copy that says seven plus. Sorry, under seven. The, law, the larger ones that you see on throughout the paper are bigger than seven, the little small ones are under seven, okay? So this guy, number one, he's under seven, right? Small size, go to five. So jump down to five. Body background black with white spots or body background light color with dark spots and the lines? Right, so A, so you're going to go to six, small white spots on a black background and a row along each side from head to tail, or a small white spot scattered with a black background from head to tip of tail. Oh, he does, he does have a couple on his tail, you can see it. So yeah, it's A, B, that would be the better answer, so what is his name? Lepidon glutensis. glutensis. Okay, you can call him Slimy. His name is Slimy. Okay, so the first name listed is the what name? Uh, 
I'm sorry, the first italicized name is the scientific name. Sorry, I wasn't clear. The whole first name listed uh, in this little sequence is the scientific name. The second name is the common name. All right, so you're, you're right. The, the first word of the first name is the genus, and the second word of the first name is the species. But overall, we have scientific name listed and then common name listed. So work on, uh, you should identify all 11. It should probably take you about 10 minutes. Write right on your own paper, just in your notes, it's fine, okay? Because I keep these from year to year, I try not to kill too many trees. Not that you have to kill too many trees. Identify these down, we only did number one. We just did number one, but number one is slimy. You guys need to do two, three, three, eleven. Did you try slimy? Yeah, slimy is the slimy.